All right, well, let's um, go ahead and read the text we're going to be looking at this evening. And I will do my best to, to cover it, but again, we're just going to touch on, on these individual points. Uh, let me just say I'm going, I'm going to cover in, well, in probably uh, 25 minutes what uh, William Gurnall wrote a 1,200-page book about. So there's a lot more that can be said than, than what's going to be said here, but these are just <clears throat> the, the, the main points, I guess you might say. So first of all, the text. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Well, may the Lord bless His Word to our hearing this evening. Have you ever read this passage? Okay. We're all aware of what it says, right? And this is a command. This is what we need to be doing because we are involved in a battle. There is a very real being, uh, the devil, and he has an army, his demons, that are trying to destroy us. So we have to be on our guard, especially as we strike out, as it were, to do the Lord's work. That's usually when we see the battle really uh, get intense, not when we're sitting on, you know, in, on the sidelines, but when we're involved in the battle, and that's what the Lord calls us to be engaged in. Now, remember this morning, Paul reminded us that our time is short. Even if we live to be 100, which most of us will not, that's still nothing more than just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. I think, I think Adam probably <laughs> saw his life the same way, though he lived into his mid-900s, right? The night of our lives is almost over. And the eternal day of heaven is about to break. And so we must put on the Lord Jesus Christ. His character, His graces, His love, His mercy, His devotion to God, His desire to fight the Lord's battles. And we must make no room in our lives for our flesh. Now we also, as we saw this morning, need to put on the armor of light. That's what we're going to look at this evening, the, the equipment that Jesus has given to us so that we may successfully fight against our enemies and stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, Paul begins by exhorting us to be strong in the Lord. Okay, we, we don't have the strength we need in order to fight this battle. And so Paul first directs us to look to the Lord Jesus Christ to find it in Him because it's only in Him that we're going to find the necessary resources, the supply, the provision of the Holy Spirit, who alone can give to us what we need, the ability to resist temptation, the courage to overcome our fears, the power to do what God commands us to do, as well as the willingness to suffer. That all comes from the Holy Spirit. We might say even the armor. You know, all of these are just different descriptions of, of graces or virtues that the Holy Spirit uh, confers to us, gives to us. Now, it, it all boils down to love, as, as I've said before, because if we have this love, we'll, we'll really have everything that we need. God kindled that love in our hearts when He gave to us His Holy Spirit. We have that power. But again, let's not forget, we need to strengthen it. 
we need to, to you know, encourage it by fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ as He reveals Himself to us in His Word. The more that we see of His love and His mercy towards us, the more our love is going to grow for Him, and that will make us willing to spend and be spent for His glory. So first of all, we need to be strong in the Lord, and there's only one way to do that, spend time with Him in the Word and in prayer. Have communion with Christ and grow in your love for Him. Secondly, Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. Now, before we look at the parts of this armor, we, I just want us to note a couple of things. The first is that we need to remember, again, that this, the armor is spiritual. Okay? The, the armor is not physical. The armor has to be spiritual because our enemies are spiritual. What Paul, the way he refers to them here is the devil, the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul is reminding us that our warfare is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the government. It's not against our neighbors, it's not against people who get hostile to us, you know, if we share the gospel with them, though sometimes it seems like they are the enemy. They're not really the enemy. The enemy is the one who influences the souls of these people to get angry at us. Our warfare is against the kingdom of darkness, and really our warfare is to try to rescue these souls who appear to be enemies, who are acting as enemies, to rescue them from the devil who is the true enemy. So the armor is spiritual because our enemies are spiritual. And the second thing to note is that if we're going to stand against this enemy, we have to use the armor, okay? And notice not just part of it, but we have to have all of it. Paul writes, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Well, lest, lest we think that, you know, we only have pieces of it and not all of it, we do need to remember that we do have all of the armor. It comes as a suit, okay? You can't have just the shoes without the belt and, and so forth. If we have the Spirit of God, we have all these graces already. But again, as with all of God's graces that He gives to us, we need to work at putting these things on. When Paul says, put it on, He's not saying we're, all, we're, we're naked and we need to put it on, but what he is saying is put it on more fully, okay? Uh, strengthen these different areas that these parts of the armor represent. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Again, we need to be spending time in His Word and in prayer to strengthen these virtues that are represented by these pieces of armor. So. What is the armor? What, what do these things mean? Well, I think, you know, Paul is describing it in terms of the armor that was used in his day. He's drawing analogies from uh, the particular pieces of, of a Roman soldier's armor to particular virtues that we need to develop. Now, first of all, he says in verse 14, we need to gird our loins with truth. Now, here he's talking about the sash, the belt or the waistband a soldier would use to tie up his robe or which he would also use to hang his, his sword. Now, some believe that what Paul's referring to here is the, the, by the belt is, is the, tr well, he, he's referring to the belt as the truth because the truth is something that we need to hold close to us. So... Tie it around your waist, you know, hold it, hold it close. Well, that, that's possible. He could also be saying that God's truth is what holds the whole of the armor together because without the belt, it, it basically, you don't have that unifying thing that keeps it all in one piece. Or he may be drawing our attention to the connection between the truth, which the belt represents, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, also the truth, since the belt is used to hold up the sword. Well, it's hard to say, you know, what this analogy is. It may not be entirely clear, but one thing is clear, and that is that God's truth is important. We need to know it. 
so that we can apply it thoroughly to our lives because it is the standard. These are our marching orders. This is God's strategy for the battle. Okay, there is a battle and there's a certain way God wants us to fight it and we need to know what that is. We need to know the truth. As God told the Jews in the Old Testament, remember, when he gave them his commandments, I want you to bind them as signs on your hands and on your foreheads. And they, they ended up doing that literally, but also to write them on the doorposts and the gates of their houses. They still do that today so that they would remember the commandments to do them. So we are to bind God's truth about our waste so that we might remember it in order to do it. Now, secondly, Paul says we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate refers to a metal plate, usually made of iron or bronze, that covered the chest, not, not the back, but the chest, and was meant to protect the vital organs, which are in the, the, the cavity here. Well, Paul refer, is referring here to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I think that, that part of it is, is clearer that the Father gives to us as a free gift through faith, the righteousness by which we are justified. And I think he applies this to the breastplate because it's this that protects our spiritual life, our vital organs, so to speak. There is nothing more deadly to spiritual life than the belief that we will enter into heaven through our own works. Again, you know, that, that quote that uh, comes up during the time of the Reformation, <clears throat> I think it might have been uh, Reeves that mentioned this as well, where he, or it could have been Godfrey, where Martin Luther said that, that every, every week he preaches justification by grace through faith alone because every week his people forget it. And we forget it too. And we need to be constantly reminded that we are not justified by our works, but we are justified by the works of Christ. We need to be trusting in Him alone. Well, what is the danger of trusting in our works rather than in His? Well, think about what Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 5 verse 4. And what, what he is referring to here is the fact that the Galatians were listening to the Judaizers who told them they needed to be circumcised. He says this, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Whenever we shift our trust from Christ to something that we do, whether, even if it's a, a, a rite or a ceremony that God commands us, like, like baptism, you know, we are, we are falling from the principle of grace. We are replacing you know, Christ with our obedience, with the law. And that's why the enemy, or the enemies of our souls, our spiritual enemies, the devil and our flesh, continually attack that particular truth. Always trying to convince us that we must be good enough to be accepted. You know, that, that's Roman Catholic dogma. You have to be good enough for God to accept you. He's going to help you. But if you're not good enough, God is not going to accept you. Okay? You have to be perfectly righteous. Well, we are only in Christ. We need to trust Christ's righteousness alone, His obedience, His death on the cross for our acceptance with the Father. That is the breastplate of righteousness, and it protects the vitals of our spiritual life. Now, thirdly, he says, we must put on the shoes or the sandals of the preparation of the gospel of peace. And Paul means one of two things here, perhaps both, that we do need to be ready or prepared at all times to share the gospel. The only message by which we, may, we can have peace with God. He may mean that. That's usually how we understand this. But it can also mean that we, since this is a, a part of our defensive armor, a part of the armor of God, uh, it, it may mean that we must be firmly convinced that the gospel is the only way that we can have peace with God and acceptance with God. 
Now, that second possibility may explain why Paul places it at the foundation of the armor, you know, at the shoes, which are very foundational. If we are not fully convinced that the gospel is the only way, then we're not going to be effective in our warfare, are we? We're going to be reluctant to share it if we're not convinced that we need to and open ourselves up to, you know, the ridicule or the shame that might come with it or to open ourselves up to the suffering that might come with it. We have to be convinced that the gospel is the only way that a person can be saved from everlasting damnation in hell. We have to believe that or we're, we're not going to be willing to stick our necks out for it. We have to believe what the Bible says is true. So whether it's being prepared to share the gospel, I think one of the ways, one of the best ways to be prepared is to be convinced that it's true that it really is the only way to be reconciled to God. Now, fourthly, in addition to all, he says, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The word that Paul uses here doesn't refer to, you know, that small circular shield you might see in those gladiator type, you know, movies but rather a large and rectangular shield that was used to deflect swords and spears and arrows that were coated with leather and soaked with water because the enemy would often tip their arrows with something that was flammable in the hopes of setting a building on fire or maybe inflicting greater damage on their opponents. These shields, of course, would protect them our enemy, the devil, attacks us with flaming arrows. Have you seen, uh, have you ever seen a rendition or read the book Pilgrim's Progress? You know how when Christian gets to the gates, uh, the, the wicked, the, not the wicked, but the wicked gate. And as um, the door is opened, um, the guy pulls him through before the enemy can shoot the fiery darts from the castle that's, uh, you know, waiting to kill pilgrims on the way in. Well, he's, he's, essentially picturing there something that, that is true. The enemy is hurtling flaming arrows at us, fiery darts, temptations, okay, that he knows will be effective against us. And remember Thomas Brooks who reminds us that Satan is a, he's a master fisherman. He knows how to bait his hooks. He knows where our weaknesses are. Well, here they're pictured not as baited, you know, golden hooks that are baited, or I should say hooks that are baited with a golden bait that's going to attract us but rather the hook itself, which is the flaming dart, which, if it strikes, is going to do some damage. You know, he either parades things in front of us that um, we shouldn't look at, shouldn't have. He appeals to our fleshly desires or to our desire for fame and recognition, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Well, Paul is telling us that faith... Faith in the promises of God can deflect or quench these arrows. Faith in His promise to help us stand up against the devil's attacks. Faith to understand what's really going on, what's really at stake here. Faith to see what it is that is ahead of us, the glories of heaven, so that we're willing to let go of the things of the world in order to pursue God's kingdom. We have to believe what God says in His Word is true, not just the gospel, but all the promises that are attached to the gospel, if we're going to be able to overcome the temptations that the devil is going to bring against us, because whatever he's going to tempt us to do, God has something much more glorious that we need to believe and see is glorious and know that He is going to give it to us and that we're trading, uh, well, gold and and precious jewels for something that's worth, you know, uh, worth less than, than dung if we make this trade because it's sin. So the shield of faith. Fifthly, he says, take the helmet of salvation. I think Paul here is using uh, this image in the way he does in 1 Thessalonians 5.8 to refer to assurance. The assurance that we belong to the Lord. He says there, but since we are of the day, let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, as the helmet covers and protects the head, our heads, so assurance 
guards our minds from despair as our enemy constantly is attacking our standing before God. You know, Satan doesn't want you to believe that you are saved if you are saved. He wants you always to put that in doubt because if it's in doubt, you'll always be focused on that rather than on serving the Lord. Well, assurance is our only defense to know that we actually do belong to Him. The conviction, first of all, that God is true to His promise to save us if we trust in Jesus alone. We need to believe that He will give what He has promised. We need to believe He's trustworthy. And then we need to see within our lives the love that the Spirit of God gives to us for God and for Christ, which is the evidence that we have trusted Him. So our assurance comes from, you know, the fact that God is trustworthy, and it comes from the fact that we see the evidence of the Spirit's work in us that is only true of those who are truly trusting in Christ, and that is the love we have for Him and for the things of the Lord. Now, Paul says this is the armor that we need to take up in its entirety if we are to stand against the evil one. Now, Paul may also be showing us here, maybe not, but this is the way it's been understood. He may be showing us here also <clears throat> our need to keep going forward, to press forward, because this armor only gives us protection in one direction, and that is against the enemies that are in front of us, not the ones who are behind us. And that was, that was Bunyan's view when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. I wanted to give you a quote from that because you realize that whole book is about spiritual warfare, not just when he's in the Valley of Humiliation facing Apollyon, but throughout the entire book, it's all about spiritual warfare and how to use God's armor to overcome the various temptations that Satan's emissaries are going to use to get you off the path. Now, this comes from that part of Pilgrim's Progress where Christian is fighting Apollyon. This is what we read. Now, Christian had not gone far in this valley of humiliation before he was severely tested. For he noticed a very foul fiend coming over the field to meet him. His name was Apollyon. At this, Christian became afraid and immediately pondered whether he ought to retreat or stand his ground. But on further consideration, he realized that he had no armor on his back. And therefore, to expose himself there in fleeing would probably give this foe the advantage with his use of piercing darts. So he determined to risk confrontation with this enemy, for he further thought, if, if I only had in mind the saving of my life, then it would still be best to stand my ground. So the point here is that the enemy may be, you know, he may try to intimidate us to get us to turn away, to get us to turn back into the world. If he does that, he's actually been successful. Remember when the Jews came out of Egypt and things got rough, that they immediately thought about going back to Egypt, to go back in the direction in which they came. Well, if we would arrive in heaven, we have to keep moving forward. Remember what Jesus said on one occasion, no one having put their hand to the plow, you know, in the kingdom of heaven and turning back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Those who know the Lord and who are saved by His grace, who love Him, will continue to press forward. We can do that, okay, through the armor which God supplies by the Holy Spirit. Now, finally, let's consider two offensive weapons. Paul says in verses 17 and 18, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now, in Paul's day, Roman soldiers were equipped with at least one weapon, which they would use to injure or to kill their opponents, okay? I mean, what, <laughs> it's one thing to have armor to protect your life, but you still have to stop them from doing the damage. So... Uh, they very often had a sword, and the Lord has also given to us a sword, okay? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Now, we need to realize that in this battle, we cannot kill the enemy, okay? The Lord is going to do that in His own time. I mean, the devil is immortal. He will be destroyed in a sense. He will be um, 
confined to the lake of fire one day, although right now he is, he is free to roam, at least within certain boundaries. And the same thing is true of the demons. We cannot kill them, okay? But that's not what the sword is for. It's not to kill them. Rather, it is to w repel them or to wound them, okay? And what I believe he's referring to here again are the promises of God. James writes in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. One of the promises that he gives to us. Now, Bunyan also incorporates this in the battle that Christian fights with Apollyon. You know, Christian cannot kill him, but he can drive him away. He can resist him so that he flees. Bunyan describes the conclusion of the battle in this way. He says at this point, after some, some battling, Christian began to despair of staying alive. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was preparing his final blow so as to destroy this good man, yet Christian was enabled to nimbly stretch out his hand and regain a grip on his sword. At the same time, he cried out, Do not rejoice against me, O my implacable enemy, for when I fall, I shall yet arise. By the way, that is a promise okay, that he's quoting. Then he gave Apollyon a deadly thrust which caused him to draw back as if he had received a fatal wound. Now in perceiving this, Christian moved in upon him while declaring, even so, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. As a result, Apollyon quickly spread out his dragon's wings and fled away so the Christian saw him no more. Okay, so again, we can't kill the enemy, but we can repel him, we can resist him so that he flees from us. The word that Paul uses here does not refer to a scimitar, you know, where you can take these large sweeping blows at your enemy, but rather a two-edged knife or dagger. Uh, the typical um, soldier had to inflict injury in close combat. Okay, we often see, you know, those, in those wars, they have rather large swords. Uh, apparently that wasn't necessarily the case. The word, at least, that Paul uses here refers to a smaller weapon. And he seems to be indicating that we need to be prepared to use God's word skillfully in close combat with the enemy to know how the promises apply and apply them. As we're going to be engaging the enemy in very close quarters, because let's not forget where the battle is actually waged. You know, it's, it's not so much out there. It's not like Satan's around the corner and he's going to attack you like he does Christian in the Valley of Humiliation. But he's going to attack your mind. He's going to attack your desires. He's going to perhaps even introduce thoughts into your mind, at least parade them in front of your eyes. Okay? So you need to be able to, to deal, since you're going to be wrestling with him at close quarters, you need to be able to use the Word of God skillfully to deal with those ideas, as Paul says, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, expelling those ideas that should not be in your mind, do not entertain them, push them out, resist them, and continue to claim God's promises in order that you might do that. And then finally, Paul says we need to pray. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And here Paul drops the analogy to remind us of our need to pray for ourselves and for each other, that we might be strengthened in the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit. We can do this privately, you know, in our prayer closets and at home in our devotions. We can do it corporately as we meet together on the Lord's Day or midweek for prayer. Or certainly we can do both. But we need to pray. We need to pray if we are going to stand. He says, pray at all times. So that doesn't mean there isn't a moment in which you're not praying, but it does mean to pray continually. Whenever you're faced with something, pray. Just as you think of it throughout the day, pray. Ask for the Lord's strength. Ask for His blessing. We need to pray in the Spirit. Okay? The Spirit is the one who gives us the desire to pray, gives us direction in our prayers, brings the promises, brings the Word of God into our minds. But we need to pray not only for ourselves, but we need to pray for, for each other. And we need to pray for all of Christ's saints. 
and his kingdom, that it may continue to move forward. So may the Lord grant to us that, that we may be strong in his strength, in the power of his Holy Spirit, by spending time in his word and prayer. May he help us to grow in these spiritual graces. Remember, these are things that are represented by the armor. They are things that are real, real spiritual graces that we can become stronger in. May He help us to become skillful in our understanding of God's Word and our use of it. Um, you know, the, the text that Thomas Brooks uses in his Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices is we are not ignorant of His schemes. Well, oftentimes we are. We don't even know He's at work around us or within us. And let's not forget, it's not always the devil that's after us. We have corruption. We have sin in our hearts that's also after us. We need to know how it works, how He works, so we can see it coming. And we know how to face it, okay? And we need to give ourselves to prayer for ourselves and for each other so that we'll have the strength we need to stand against the world, the devil, and our flesh, and to be used by Him to help others escape the devil's kingdom and enter into the kingdom of light along with ourselves so that we don't become casualties along the way. God will give us the grace if we belong to Him, but it will show itself by our putting on the full armor and engaging in this battle and doing what it is that we have just read, we, we have just been exhorted uh, to do. Well, let's, let's take just a moment, shall we, and let's, um, let's bow in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to give us the grace to do these things.